about the connection between education and, and development and, and the well-being of our, of our people. Uh, the title of the session is Creating an Innovative Ecosystem for Education. Implied on it is that we need a different ecosystem. It's not just one thing. And we have a very diverse panel, first here, that I'll introduce in a second. Uh, but let me start with two um, stars of education and stars both uh, uh, for, with a lot of experience and we, with a lot of uh, energy. Uh, Victoria, uh, Clara Victoria Colbert, Vicky, uh, founder and executive director of Fundación Escuela Nueva. And then later, Andrea Chavarria, Global Shaper, uh, an executive director of Fundación Carlos y Sonia Jaime. She's going to also talk about her own experience. So she'll be fire starters for the session. Basically, she, she, they both um, set, it, set it up for us in terms of challenges and, and provocations. Please go on. Vicky, you welcome. Microphone, no. There. Well, in this forum, um, I think most of the panels have us the conclusion that Without education, nothing, no sustainable development goals can be achieved. It's been, you know, a general consensus in this forum. Uh, and also, I remember in Zhongtian at the World Conference of Education that took place many years ago in Thailand. You know, there was a big declaration, very important declaration, saying that education is so important, it cannot be only in the hands of governments. That was a very important output of that, of that declaration. However, changes in education are, are not occurring as fast as the rest of society. And this is a problem. Education systems are like failed companies. No results. Nothing works. Uh, and you know, if when you compare the health sector with the education sector, I, I want to give a concrete example. If you bring a doctor from 100 years ago into a hospital today, that doctor is lost. Everything has changed. If you bring a teacher from 100 years ago into a classroom today, that teacher is not so lost because education is not changing as fast as the rest of society. So this is a very crucial point because more of the same is not enough. Just expanding current educational systems as they are is not enough. We're wasting our money, putting a lot of money into current education systems that are not having results. Why? And this is my work with Escuela Nueva, because we need a paradigm shift. You know, we, we've known the theory of education for 150 years, Montessori, John Dewey, but all these ideas come into the elite schools, not into the poorest of the poor schools. So we really need in the region to go from transmission of knowledge to social construction of knowledge. We need to talk about the new role of the teacher for the 21st century. You know, there have been changes in the Act of Learning Act, you know, we're going from teacher-driven to child-centered, nothing new in the philosophy. In the concept of time, not everybody learns the same thing at the same time. So we need more personalized uh, type of strategies. And not only that, but we also need the concept of space. Learning doesn't occur only in schools. So how do we tackle all these issues, the concept of act, time, and space? And also, last but not least, you know, we're talking about 21st century skills, what computers cannot do, you know, all these learning to learn, learning to lead processes, learning to take initiatives, and basically learning to work in teams. And this is what companies are looking for, and this is what education systems are not provided. So this has been my work for more than 30 years with Escuela Nueva. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Andrea. Thank you, Vicky. I think that we all agree that education is the most powerful tool to um, like foster social mobility, and that's no discussion. And that happens because a high school graduate earns around $200 a month versus a college graduate can earn a thousand or more dollars a month. And usually parents that graduate from college send their kids to college. So it is a virtual circle um, that creates in society. But in Colombia, a country of 46 million people, we are only graduating two out of 10 students that graduate from high school. Only two students out of 10 are graduating from college. This happens because only four are actually going and we have a 50% dropout rate. Why? Because public universities are really good, they're good quality, but they're just a few, so the spots are very competitive. So only the smart students are getting those spots. And the private universities are too expensive for the rest of the masses to afford. 
and I think this is important, and we have student loans with crazy interest rates between 12 to 23%. They require co-signers with liabilities. So we have basically a sandwich of the middle classes and the low classes, and only in Latin America, only the smart students and the rich students are going to college. And this is something that worries me because access to massive college is important. And even though program, projects like Scala, my social enterprise, is partnering with private universities and buying future tuition seats at wholesale prices, translating these discounts to low middle income families and allowing low and middle income families to purchase their children's future tuition seats in a small monthly payments and creative ideas are coming up is not enough, and I think the panel um, should discuss access, massive access to higher education. So I would like to challenge the panel, not only to think about this human capital crisis, uh, but also to have fun and to think about like how is the higher education of the future is gonna look like, and how are us, the young generations, gonna be involved in this process. Thank you. As I said, the fire starters, and they uh, both have both presented with, with challenges, and, and, but also with, with optimism. So let me introduce quickly the panel in the order that they will uh, um, intervene and, and the ecosystem they represent themselves. So to my left, I have uh, Stefan Bullrich, a young global leader, a good friend, uh, the current minister of education of Argentina, and, and I think a big hope for education, not only in Argentina, but in the region. Um, we ha I have, following him, we have um, Sergio Fonseca from Pearson. Uh, he has a, a extended experience in education and education reform. Uh, and he also uh, represents, of course, a big part of the ecosystem in companies, private sector, dealing with materials, technology, and other aspects of it. Then we have Eduardo Bontempo. He's an entrepreneur. Uh, he started Geeky in Brazil. And um, he was a, a Schwab Foundation social entrepreneur. Uh, and he, of course, will chip in with the role of technology in this ecosystem and, you know, what are the challenges and the boundaries, et cetera. And then we'll go to Passy. Passy Salberg, he's a professor at Harvard Education School. Um, uh, he's an expert in education. He's finished, too. So it's interesting because, uh, not finished, finished. <laughs> yeah, just, um, <laughs> uh, which is interesting because, of course, we all look up to Finland and what they've achieved, um, and that's actually his expertise. And so he, he'll, he'll, to give us and share with us his learnings and lessons for, for Latin America. And last but not least, we have Gabriela Ramos from OECD, but also from Mexico, who will um, focus or give a regional focus to the questions. Uh, because here we are for the World Economic Forum in Latin America, and as a region, we might be able, I think we are, we could be able to do uh, more together. So with that intro about the whole, whole panel, let me turn it to Esteban. So, Stefan, from the public sector perspective, uh, you know, what are the challenges? How can we move faster than Big East? You know? Arturo, I, I thanks for, for the introduction and the hope you have on me. Um, but I, I don't want to avoid an issue that I think is very important in this arena of the World Economic Forum, that is the death of Joe Cox yesterday. Uh, she was killed. Um, she's a British MP, but she's also, she was and also a young global leader, member of our community. And she was killed because of hatred, only because of the way she thought about the um, United Kingdom going into, the, into Europe. And I think we have to call them out. We have to call out those that are pushing hatred among the world as leaders, because that creates an educational environment where teachers have to teach. The, we got to understand that as leaders, we need to promote the education of the example. We are leaders and we need to lead the world to a better place, committed to improving the state of the world. That's the logo of the World Economic Forum. And to stand by it, we need to lead by example. And I think Joe did that, and because of that, she was killed. And because a lot of leaders are not doing that. And I think we need to call them out. And the world needs to, to think about these crimes of hatred that are coming out because of this bad leadership we have that are taking hate as a, as a flag and as a way of doing policy, politics. So I, sorry for that, but I just wanted to mention it. Uh, I thought it, it was uh, very bad news for us yesterday, and, and I wanted to mention it uh, today. Going to the question, I think the basic reason 
that we have this conversation is that politics gets in the way. Uh, why? Because education is long term. And politicians usually cannot think long term because they have urgencies. They have electoral urgencies. And I think if we don't put that on the table and talk about that, we're not going to solve the problem. Andrea just said, we all agree that education is very important. Sorry, Andrea, that's not the case, unfortunately. But the truth is, if you ask a society, and I'm, I'm going to talk always about Argentina because I want to talk about things that I know. In Argentina, education comes up seventh in the issues that people think are important for their life. Security, personal security, inflation, economy, unemployment, narcotics or drug addiction, all of them come first. But the truth is that education could solve all of them if we work with it. But leaders are not choosing to put education as a solution to those problems. And I think that's the biggest problem we have today. I think we come to these sessions, we hear leaders talking about this, but the truth is when we go back, electoral emergencies get in the way. So I think one of the biggest points is here is we have, again, and that's why I brought up the, the issue of leadership, we have to lead a society that needs to understand because it doesn't have the education in, uh, needed to understand that education can solve the problems of unemployment, of personal security, of uh, narcotics. And I think that is the biggest and most important tool that we have to develop a society. Thank you, Esteban. Um, Sergio, private sector, but you've been in every angle. So what needs to change? How, how can we move, move the system? Thank you very much. Um, to give it a Latin America context perspective, I want to make everybody reflect a bit that many of us in Latin America are an example of what, what can education do for you. So some of us sitting here have made enormous progress thanks to education. And it's been generation after generation that we have been improving and education has been part of the development of Latin America. That is the importance for me of education. And talking about long term, I do agree with Esteban, it is a long term thing. So what governments are doing today in terms of reforms, there's a difference between reforms that are thought for the longer term and reforms that are thought for the period of the, of the government. The example that I can give is the Mexican one right now has been thought for the long term and that is very important because it is also solving problems that have many, many years happening. Um, so in, if you think about long term, I, I do think we have big hopes in Latin America that we can improve this if, if we think long term. The best example that I can give is uh, the, diff the blended generations that we have currently in every school. So we're, 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 we're fighting or uh, struggling with the non-native generation in terms of technology with the techno technological na digital natives. Right now, it is struggling and both private schools and public sector are, are, are struggling with this. If we think about it long term, it will get solved because we will continue to train teachers in how to adapt into this new, new, new world. And the new world will continue to grow into the, the teacher's uh, population. So we do believe there's hope. Now, in terms of changing the paradigm and answering to Vicky's point, I, don't th I, I also <coughs> think that part of changing the paradigm is to think about the difference between education and learning. Mm -hmm. Education is the big uh, the, the subject, it's the big subject. We, the private companies, work for the educators. So we are about education, but we work for educators. So what we, what, what we sh should all think about is the learning process. And that's why it's part of the 21st century um, skills. It, it talks about learning skills, and we need to think about the learning process and the methodologies for both teachers and students to learn. Mm -hmm. So to end up with my comment, I do think we have huge hope, but we need to focus both on, in Latin America, mm -hmm. on teachers, and in students, and in companies, uh, the, and the private companies that are willing to help the government and their schools. We have both. 
we have in, in actually part of our of our team they are teachers some are authors so we're trying to change the paradigm from education to learning in, in, in helping the methodologies of learning to make sure we teach on learning and we help students with that. Thank you, Sergio. Um, Eduardo, the difference between, you know, the decades ago since fr from the time we've known the, ne the needed changes, the big difference in the pan ten, past 10, 15 years has been technology. So you have a very successful startup uh, scaling up quickly. How do you see technology playing out? And, and as I asked you b before the panel, uh, what are the limits too? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think technology addresses most of the, you know, the points that Vicky raised uh, regarding where the learning happens and uh, the personalization process of learning. Uh, and just to give some statistics in Brazil to put everybody on the same level, in Brazil, from every student that enters high school, half, 50% of the students do not finish high school. So we have a 50% dropout rate. And from the ones that finish, only 10 to 15% has the minimum level of math and Portuguese. So all the rest, they are not even close to the minimum level of math and Portuguese. So this is the challenge that we have. Uh, and to tackle this challenge uh, by you know, investing in more teachers, uh, it's going to be so expensive that I truly believe that technology can play a, a very important role in this. So, uh, for instance, uh, what we believe in Iki, uh, we believe that people are different, people learn in different ways, and people are in different moments of their learning process. So to teach everybody the same way doesn't make any sense. So what we do, we use technology to personalize the process of learning of each person according to the difficulty level of each person, according to the media that each person learns best. People learn, some people learn watching videos, some people watch, uh, some people learn uh, reading texts. So what we do, we use technology to personalize the process. Uh, and, you know, of course, data plays a big role on this. So we, we need to work on scale to make sure that we can really have uh, a strong uh, recommendation engine, a strong intelligence uh, to recommend what really makes sense for each person. And what we saw is that uh, by, you know, doing the products uh, with technology, we can reach scale very fast in a very cheap way. So for instance, uh, this year uh, we are doing a project with the federal government in Brazil uh, in which uh, we are preparing students to join the university. So in Brazil, it's very similar uh, to here in Colombia. They do a standard, standardized test to join university. So we are preparing all the senior students in Brazil to do this exam. And we currently have 3 million students that are you know, using the product financed by the government. So it's really huge, it's really scalable. Uh, but the challenge is that uh, you know, to really reach the people that needs the most, you have to interact with the government, right? Uh, we provide technology for the private sector, and it's okay. They, they of course, they need, but it, you know, increases the gap between the, 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 the people that can pay and people cannot pay. Then comes the challenge of, you know, negotiating with the government. The government doesn't know how to buy technology yet in Brazil. If you have to wait for an auction process that takes like six months or, or a year, to sell your technology as a startup, you're dead. You, you do not have all this time, right? And we took four years to, you know, close this deal with the government. And what happens right after we close the deal, it changes the government. Mm -hmm. And then everybody that comes in says, oh, the other guys were doing everything wrong. So we're going to shut down everything that is, is, is you know, was, was made by the previous government. So what happens is that we have 3 million people that are, you know, benefiting from, from our product that right now are in a very tough position because we don't know what's going to happen. And as a startup, to be truly honest, we cannot depend on this. We need to, you know, make sure we, we, we have predictability, we have sustainability, uh, because uh, we, don't, we don't have resources for this. So this is the challenge, but technology, we really believe, is, is the way. And it's already, you know, making all the results. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Pasi, you come and see us with, uh, with you know, with fresh eyes, uh, 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 Latin American. You hear about this is misalignment. You hear about the hope 
and yet only elite schools really are implementing things that are needed. And of course, Finland, beyond your, your own expertise, but Finland is a, is a showcase of great uh, education. Uh, what are the lessons? What can we learn uh, from Finland and of course the rest of your experience? Yeah, first of all, I want to thank the World Economic Forum for organizing this type of panel. I think it's very important to have a conversation about uh, education things. Um, and, and secondly, when I was thinking about the title of this panel, I, I would provoke, uh, like to provoke a little bit, going back to what the fire starters said. I, I think part of the problem, actually, that Vicky was uh, stating in the opening, uh, her, her remarks, is that we have been focusing too much on innovation. You know, I argue as a researcher that most of the ideas, most of the innovations in education to make systems work, systems like Finland or Singapore or Canada, mm -hmm. they already exist. And I don't know any other area of human endeavor where we behave like this, that we, when we kind of create an innovation that doesn't work, we go and create yet another innovation. Just think about business or technology or even health, uh, anything, when things don't work, people try to improve those things, right? They try to change them a little bit and see w what works. So I, when I look at education during the last 25, 30 years, uh, I think, you know, this is exactly what we have been doing, that we are not really making the best use, what Vicky was also mentioning, all these ideas during the last 100 years that seems to be working. Now, the good news is that to, today we know much more than we would have known, like, if this panel was 15 years ago, if we were sitting here 15 years ago, we wouldn't know where in the world are the countries, the education systems that have been able to, you know, fix the things and make things work, uh, why they are doing better than the others, mm -hmm. and how the other systems like here in Latin America could get close to what they do. So 15 years ago, we would be talking about these things in a, in a darkness. But now the good news is that we know much more about those things. We know much more about the high performing education systems, what they do, where they are, and um, why they are where they are. And that's why, you know, one of, one of the things for the governments, um, uh, for like Argentina, for example, and some of the others that have been working, uh, working in Latin America is to, you know, before doing anything else is to ask, ask your advisors or people in your staff that what do we know about these things? Where are the good ideas and practices and examples, the people who can, who can do these things? 15 years ago, there was no way to do that. Or even if you did that, you often get wrong answers, kind of a bad ideas. And that's why we haven't been able to see the, the change in the education system because there's so many bad ideas around. So let me say a word about Finland because often people think that Finland is a kind of a silver bullet and kind of a magic <laughs> island where everything, you know, we have somehow figured out um, how, how to make things work. That's not true. Finland is just part of this global package of high-performing education systems like many of the Canadian provinces, Alberta, Ontario, uh, British Columbia, Quebec, belong to those things, uh, Singapore, Japan in Asia, some other countries. And you know, the interesting thing now is that from the research point of view or policy point of view, if you put all those high-performing or successful education systems together and ask the question that, is there anything that they're doing similarly, similarly they are in, in the same ways? They are kind of a set of things that these countries are doing. And this is the kind of a new list of lessons or ideas that policymakers and governments should be considering. Transfer is always a bad idea. You cannot transfer anything from Finland or Singapore to Argentina or here in Colombia and say that because it works somewhere else, it, it should work here. But we can learn a lot. And what, one of those things, if I just mention one or two of those things, one of those things that is common to all high-performing education systems today is that they all function as a system. So they don't fragment or kind of split their systems in the subsystems of having private schools or public-private partnerships and public schools or teacher preparation systems where part of the teachers are trained in the universities and others come through windows and doors of all sorts of uh, things they have. <coughs> sorry, they, they run their they, they education as a, as a system. Then the other one that we didn't know 15 years ago is that all of these successful education systems have somehow realized that key to you know, improve learning uh, of all, all students is to focus and invest in equity and equality in the system. In other words, work hard at the level of the policy and resources to make sure that everybody, uh, all children have an opportunity to learn. It's very easy to say this. It's very hard to 
you know, turn this into a policy and then seek funding and resources to do that. And finally and lastly, I think I, I wouldn't probably be able to leave this um, uh, my statement here without making a reference about the teachers. The teacher issue is often misunderstood. People think that it's all about teachers, that as soon as we find good people to teach in our systems, everything will w work fine, but it doesn't work like this. The teacher system is much more complicated than that. We, ha we need to have a system where teaching is seen by young people as something that is attractive and a potential lifelong career. And now this is, this is disappearing in most of the countries within the OECD and uh, in the world, actually. The teaching is becoming a kind of a thing that you do for a couple of years and then you do something real, okay? And if you have a system, if you have in, in your system, if you have seeds like this, that's the kind of an invitation of failure. You, you, you cannot fix your education system by having a kind of a status of, a status of teaching profession, something that young people don't really see as a lifelong thing. All of those high performers that I mentioned, they have worked towards this type of thing that the teaching is seen as a potential uh, lifelong career. It's paid well, teachers are prepared like lawyers and doctors in uh, research universities, and it's hard to get in there, and it's hard to get graduate, but as soon as you do that, then you have a situation that Vicky was calling for when you made your example about health, that that's why I think the teachers should be prepared and, and treated like we treat our doctors and lawyers as well. Thank you very much. So, Gabriela, you are a Latin American, of course, but you are the counselor to the Secretary General of the OECD. So you see the most developed countries in the world with some Latin American members. Um, and so you have, like, passy, bigger perspective. But in particular, I wanted you to address uh, the potential regional action in these things. What things can we do regional? And, and what, what, what things actually must be, uh, remain national? Well, let me, let me just say I, I, I actually... Um, I'm very happy to come after everybody because I was picking up a little bit of everyone. Um, I really think that, uh, first of all, it's very important that we put education higher in the agenda. I think that we pay lip service to education. And I would say, let's not talk, what the minister said, let, let's not talk about education in general. Let's talk about quality education because we put a lot of money. Latin America put a lot of money and we have increasing the budget to spend, the, the public expenditure on education and public expenditure on education without really changing the outcomes. So let's focus on quality education. Let's gather the evidence. We are the house of the PISA uh, test, which measures outcomes in education. And what we see for Latin America is that um, um, according to the level of development of Latin America, we don't get the outcomes that we should be getting. Uh, all the countries of Latin America that participate in the PISA report uh, locate themselves in the bottom 30%. I don't think Latin America deserves that. And that means you have uh, almost half of the students uh, performing the test, and we're not talking about those that are out, as the fire starter said, of the system. Um, they cannot uh, uh, resolve very basic equations and actually uh, locate themselves at the top uh, uh, performers in terms of the uh, 80 countries that participate, like Asia or Europe or Finland, <laughs> for the matter. Um, you have actually, uh, if you think about the, the results or the average of Latin America according to PISA, who has uh, 500 points average, but uh, Asia has 600, Latin America has 400. So we are 100 points below, which means that our children at age 15 might be receiving two or three years less of education. And this is how we structure the systems, as you say. Because what we do is really uh, uh, put the systems first and not the student. We do not invest really in supporting teachers. We do not invest in uh, having the best and the brightest becoming teachers, as Pasi said. But actually then we let them alone. They need to perform and we do not accompany them. And the quality of the education systems cannot be better than the quality of their teachers. And that's a very important point. But we can learn from the other countries. And you, uh, Pasi mentioned some of the, of the issues. But you know what is key? Latin America has neither break the socioeconomic background impact on the learning outcomes. Children that are from poor families will receive poor education and therefore we're still there. The, the high performing systems break that link. And why? Because they focus on vulnerable children. They put the best teachers in the more difficult schools. 
very complicated with our unions. <laughs> and I think Mexico, as you mentioned, has done well in terms of defining this kind of uh, system where you really focus to help those that are at disadvantage. And I think this is something that regionally can be done because this is something that brings together all of our countries. We have uh, really, for example, um, another uh, school practice uh, in, in Latin America, you have high repetition grades. Why? Because teachers don't focus on those that are vulnerable. They choose, oh, these guys are not going to make it, they, I focus to the strong kids. Well, that's completely wrong. I think that we really need to, to turn the system into the school practice that will really focus in those kids that are lagging behind. Because those that are doing well, they will be doing well in any case. And then you add up the question of the kind of skills. My God, there is a fly. <laughs> uh, the kinds of, of skills that you, um, that you need. We focus too much on cognitive skills, which is important because math, science, uh, reading is very important. But now we're, we're seeing that in, the, in a very fast-paced world, technological world, you really need some other kinds of skills, the social-emotional uh, social skills, uh, the ability to work with others, uh, the ability to, to persevere, the self-confidence, uh, all these things. But now we're talking about global competencies, which is the ability to understand others and understand ourselves. The ability to understand the biases and, and, and uh, talking about Brexit and all this very I increased fundamentalism in Europe, the reality is that tolerance is low and, and these are the kind of challenges that education systems will need to be addressing uh, going forward. Where would I put the emphasis in, in and, and one more thing, on technology. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but we did a, a, a report on how much uh, use of IT in education has improved school outcomes. Systems that use ITs had actually decreased their performance. So again, it's not the gadget, it's not the technology, it's not the, 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 the electronic board, it's how do you ensure that teachers receive the training to incorporate technology in the class, and how do you ensure that the contents are develop, developed and the technology to introduce the technology? When we got this report, we were really scared because we, I said, how am I going to go out? Because I actually presented the report to say, do not invest in technology in the classroom. Well, that's not the point. The point is that if you are going to invest in technology in the classroom, first make sure that the teachers know the technology and is comfortable with technology, that the contents are developed for, for using that technology, and that you're not going to be creating a lot of uh, 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 stress because nobody knows how to use it and everybody's focusing actually in the IT systems instead of how to use them. Uh, finally, where I will focus, and this is also related to the latest uh, uh, research, uh, I will focus on early child care education. I think that the, that the age from uh, three to five, uh, and not only to put children in safe places, but also to start uh, uh, building the foundations for strong learning, and also a, a, a great equalizer in our societies. Thank you very much. So let me uh, go into a second round of questions. But I'm, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw to you some of the things that have been said by others. And then we'll open to the, to the floor. Uh, it's really, again, we're short in time, so I, I'll ask you to be briefer this time, but thanks a lot for time management. So let me go start with Seven again. So uh, several of you actually talk about the alignment thing and about the political will. You mentioned the unions. Um, what if we start thinking different in a different uh, dimension? Uh, so for instance, last year in the Summit of the Americas, one proposition, concrete proposition from the Forum of uh, University Presidents was let's start an accreditation body like the Europe has, uh, accreditation body for universities and college degrees uh, across Latin America. But that would, of course, mean ceding some sort of sovereignty in terms of regulation. You're the Minister of Education of Argentina. Uh, what, what do you think about an idea like that? What do you think Argentina and the political process would allow? Um, well, let me tell you, President Macri has put that in the agenda of both Mercosur and UNASUR, the mobility thing. And we have a, a minister's meeting of the Mercosur on next Friday, and we're pushing forward the idea that we have an accreditation body that allows for the mobility within Mercosur and hopefully UNASUR later. So, I mean, it's, it's something that we see as very important in the region to really be a, a, an integrated region. But I, I don't want to leave the question at that because the problem today in Latin America is that 
as Eduardo said, not enough kids are getting to university. And I think it has to do a little bit of what we talked about, but we need to focus as a region on equality and uh, equal opportunities. And I think early childhood education is key. We need to give all kids of three-year-olds an access to education. Early childhood education is key to allow for uh, an improved equality once you get into primary school and then teacher training and teacher mobility within the region. I mean, our teachers are not trained in the same way, and I think the level of teaching could improve a lot if we exchange practices and also exchange teachers. Uh, I, I, we had an experience with Finland, sending teachers from Argentina to Finland, to Sweden, to the US, and just the exchange of the teachers just opened their minds and makes them better teachers. And I think the region hasn't exploited that much the fact that we have speak a common language. It's, well, Portuñol, but, <laughs> but I really think that it, it could allow for a much bigger mobility among teachers and really improve the integration, because well, we're talking about integration. I think through teachers we could achieve that integration and we're no, not moving far, uh, far ahead in that. We're also trying to propose uh, that kind of programs within the regional uh, uh, organizations. Excellent. Let, let, me jump, let me jump to you, Pasi. Uh, again, alignment. One of the themes here, and alignment in terms of the political will, um, because you mentioned these systems, but you didn't mention anything about the politics within those. Uh, and so I'm Latin American, and I imagine many here were saying, yeah, sure, but you're Finland. So you can do that. Uh, what would you say to that? I mean, what, what, and there are obvious differences, but what would you say to that? Yeah, well, first of all, these things will not happen during the one, one government period or even one decade. That ch changing the culture in terms of the politics and how the politics should be kept away from education takes some time. And we, we, we used to have a very different situation 30, 40 years ago. Um, so we, you need to be patient if you have an education reform. And that's a kind of a challenge here in this part of the world where the governments change and new things. Um, like somebody was saying that they, everything is bad what the previous governments did. And we are fortunate, actually the whole Scandinavia is fortunate to have the situation and culture where the, the kind of a previous government's work will continue regardless of who, who the, the new government or who the new minister is. But there's no, there's no kind of a magic uh, pill for you know, doing this except the kind of a systematically grow and uh, you know, make things happen. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks. So, Sergio, your private sector here in, in uh, Eduardo is too, but let me separate between more established uh, firms in the education space versus startups. Um, so we hear about, about how the, the power and, the, of course, the resources that the state has. What should be the role of that private sector in this new equality, alignment, regional action? If that's sort of a, the emergence of a new organizational paradigm for the system, uh, what should be the role of the private sector? How do you see that in the future? Well, it should be very, very active, and I think there's a lot of advisory work to do, but the, the key is collaboration. What we find with different governments in Latin America is that when the ministers find that they can, they can get help from the private sector, both local and global companies, that seriously can help them in, uh, in, in designing uh, education systems or edu education programs for the schools, and they, they it's putting together a team. Uh, it's putting let, let, let me call you just to ask one thing. How easy is to do that today? And what would you need to, be, to make it easier? I have because to I, accept I, it's easier and easier every time. And I'll tell you why. Okay. There, it, it, it may be sensible, right. but it's based on corruption, on the issue of corruption. The new ministers, which are better and better, better every day, hope gladly, okay. find that there's a niche that with companies, private, uh, both local and, glo uh, lo local and global, they can do, make, uh, build a team to do things right. While the whole system, in a way, is still working their ways. There are some projects that can be done through collaboration with the right partners. And that's what we are finding more and more in more and more countries in Latin America. So it can right. be done. It's a collaborative system. You can think of it of a, of a niche for those important projects where it's worthwhile to work as a team with these companies. So it's a niche, but it works. And the most important thing is to focus in what we call in Pearson efficacy, which is the outcomes that you were thinking about, making sure 
that school by school and program by program, there is intended outcomes identified and that the plan, the program, the resources are all focused on delivering the outcomes. If the outcome is about progress, then most surely you'll have it versus if you didn't have it. So uh, we focus, we, for the efficacy uh, process, for example, we focus on the access that somebody already called. Uh, it's it, to make sure the students have the access, then that we have the success of the program in the results, and then that we, for sure, deliver the progress in the student, that he's at other level, whether it's because he learned English, which is a normal, uh, which is a common agenda in the country in Latin America, which, be, if it's about learning English or it's about learning science or raising three points in the PISA test, but that at the end there was some progress for the student and the community. Thank you. So Eduardo, you heard about technology, so you're, you're, you're expecting this, of course. Uh, no, but it's, it's, a, it's a, of course, a super good point that I know, you, I know you're aware of. It's not technology per se. It's really the role you could play in the system. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something very interesting your first, uh, the first time, which is you have both private and public clients. So uh, as a startup, as a technology startup, what would you like to see in the ecosystem, in this ecosystem between the private and, se and public sector? Yeah, uh, I agree that technology is not gonna you know, solve all the problems. And as Gabriela said, uh, we truly believe technology is not going to replace the teacher, really. The teacher is key in the process. And what we learned in the last four years, if the teacher is not committed to using the technology, he closes the door of the room and you're out. He's not going to use it. He's going to you know, bad mouth you. He's going to do everything he wants. So we really see the teacher as the enabler of the process of, you know, inserting technology into schools, into systems, and uh, at the end of the day, reaching students. So uh, for, for us, uh, the role of the teacher is going to change. For me today, a teacher spend like two hours a week correcting homework doesn't make any sense because the technology can do this in real time. So why not use this to help teachers? Of course, then you need to train the teacher you know, to develop other skills, he's, you know, he's going to be, uh, he needs to be prepared to uh, put more contest into the subject that he's teaching, be a moderator, because the content today is anywhere, you, you take your mobile phone, the content is there, the student is learning from there, not from him. So I agree, the teacher is key, and uh, he's the one that uh, is going to enable the process for us. Regarding public and partner, uh, public and private partnerships, uh, a challenge that uh, I see, especially in Brazil, in, you know, uh, we've been working with foundations and even private companies, uh, but sometimes we feel that everybody wants to be the hero. Everybody wants to be the one that solved the problem of education. And sometimes it's not done in a more collaborative way. Uh, so I think it's really a challenge to have an alignment we at Geeky, we don't want to be heroes. We just want to, you know, develop technology that, you know, help teachers and help students. And uh, at the same time, in a challenging environment, like right now, economically, the money from companies, they disappear. Like uh, uh, social responsibility, it's gone, right? So what we decided, and you asked why we do private and public uh, schools, is because the way we uh, found to be sustainable and uh, be a social impact company. We make money from the private sector, but at the same time, I offer free access to uh, public students. I do projects uh, that are like this one we are doing with the government that we don't make even any money, but we are doing social impact. So we try to balance these in our business model. Uh, and of course, we hope that the public and private sector can be more aligned because uh, we truly believe that this is the only way we're going to reach the ones that need the most. Thank you. Briefly, Gabriela, um, we've talked about, again, alignment is, the, is a word, clearly, a key word here. Um, with an OECD perspective and, and a global perspective, is there any kind of obvious uh, lesson or idea for Latin America in terms of the organization of the education sector or the education system, ecosystem, that you can share with us before opening to the floor? Well, yeah, I think that we have learned a lot, and it has been mentioned by, by several of, of the speakers before me. 
The fact is that you need to build up a system that delivers the right practices at the, at the classroom level. That's the whole point. We think about a lot of how to administer the, the teacher assignments and how do you develop, uh, assign the, the budget and how, but we never look at what is exactly the school practice. And you need to bring the teachers with you in that sense because the teachers are the ones that are going to be experienced, are the ones that are going to be supported or not in terms of dealing with, uh, with children that have uh, learning problems. And, and therefore, I think that instead of us being uh, discouraged or, or, or um, disappointed at the outcomes, let's take a hard look and document by a technology the good school practices, because also the teaching professor is a very alone professor, profession. You're alone in front of the classes. What do you do? How do you connect the good, the good experiences of teachers? And that's what we're doing. We're doing networks of teachers that exchange themselves, uh, their problems that they learn from each other, and that can really look at how other teachers around the world have been addressing the issues. And I think this is a very powerful. The other point, uh, teacher union and teachers in general are very, very difficult to change or move. How do you turn the mindset to say you are the agent of change, but you are the one that is going to be leading the whole process and make them part of the solution. First, by having very clear uh, um, uh, definition of what you expect from them and then having very good accountability system and, and, and evaluation system and reward systems because they always think that evaluation is to punish them. Reward systems, the good teachers. Pasi, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I have just a kind of a co comment on the this global thing. Uh, PISA, OECD PISA was mentioned several times, and uh, I, I know how the situation here in Latin America is in terms of the, the so-called PISA scores. But one thing I want, just a word of warning for people like uh, like the minister here and others, is that the, the, the PISA test is not everything. And that's what was happening now is that the, some countries kind of believe that this is a, this is what the this is what the, is the, the, the ultimate indicator for improving education systems. And it is important. And I used to teach math and science myself, and I think that math and science are very important things, and reading as well. But they are not everything. And, and um, so when the ministers, when you think about you know, benchmarking your systems here to others, those in the OECD and, and the high-performing systems, just make sure that you don't destroy and do away all these beautiful, wonderful things that you have here that PISA, PISA is doing nothing about, like arts and music and literature and human rights and many other things that I, be, I believe will be a kind of a sustainable things uh, for the future. And I'm saying this only because I'm advising several ministers, your colleagues around the world, and I've been sitting down with many of them who say, when, when I ask them, that, so what is your goal? What is your vision? Where do you try to aim at as a minister? They tell me that my country will be on the top five in the OECD PISA <laughs> by 2020. And I say that this is not a vision. This is, not a, this is a nonsense. <laughs> you cannot run your system by that type of thing. So kind of a, just we have to be mindful with the, the misuse and misunderstanding what the OECD PISA is. And let me conclude by saying that many of the things that we know about education systems, why they work, we wouldn't know without the OECD PISA data. So these are absolutely critical. But at the same time, we are now seeing the kind of a wave of misunderstanding and misuse of this imp very important indicator that we have. And just uh, it's very important that the people here in Latin America can put the, o the OECD PISA test in a kind of a right place. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Esteban will go I'm next sure and then... And then Gabriela <laughs> wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think your perspective... Well, you can go. But, but uh, unless we keep it very brief, we won't have any brief. chance to give very, up. Uh, very brief. I, I, I like the way he finished. Not to misuse no, PISA. Right. But PISA is not a static. PISA started measuring cognitive skills and now is defining global competencies. That has to do with collaboration, with tolerance, with education for peace and for with many, and very difficult, I agree with you, much more difficult to measure. We have also documented, for example, gender biased and why girls are not getting into STEM. It's, it's, I just invite you to get to know PISA well, because it's true, it's not only the target, it's not only the number, it's just a full set of knowledge of what works and what does not work in education systems. Thank you. Um, Being a, a follower of PISA, I know PISA is only an x-ray, and. It doesn't measure your blood, it's an x-ray. So it's part of the system, not the whole system. So I agree with Pasi, and I think we need to take it that way. It's a very important tool, and without the x-ray, we wouldn't know if the bones are safe or not, so we need it. But I think we need to understand that it's only part of the system. And, and the Latin America has a lot to do with it, with this cultural uh, 
understanding and, and growth that needs to be promoted too. Uh, the world is, is uh, and going a little to what Andrea was saying about the future, um, my kids, we have five kids with my wife, um, and uh, they're going to have seven jobs when they grow up. You know, they're going to have seven, they're going to go through seven professions. Five of them do not exist. So creativity is very important, and you cannot measure creativity through a test. So, so I think there are values in the future that we need to understand that are, are important to be promoted in school, and that, that cannot be measured directly, and uh, uh, there are other things in society that need to be measured. And just a small point on the unions. Unions were left as the only voice in education systems in Latin America, because politicians didn't want to talk about education. So we just left them being the only. They, it's not that they are afraid of change. They don't trust us. They don't trust politicians. So we need to build trust with them. And that's what we're trying to do in Argentina, at least, because we think we gave them the whole responsibility of the system, and then we blame them because the system didn't work. And I think that's something that has to change if we want to go to a better relation with the, with the teachers. Thank you. So we are very short on time, but we can take uh, a couple of questions from the audience. I'll, I'll ask you to just ask them, and then just together we'll try to you know, chip in with responses from the panel before we uh, wrap it up. Please. Can we? Thank you. Maria Alexandra Vélez from Pearson. You all talk about different pieces of the education ecosystem, but I haven't heard anyone talking about parents. And we know that parents' engagement in education is as important as the work of the teacher in the classroom. So how are you going to integrate all these actors, all these pieces, and parents into that to make education successful? Thank you. Someone else? Leonor? I work for an organization that is called United World College, and we're taking this very strong international baccalaureate academic program and combining it with a residence program and a co-curricular program. We're trying to teach our students all those global skills through a social entrepreneurship, um, like main vertebral cord of the whole program. And it was super challenging with the teachers, super challenging. We had the best partners and it was great, but actually making the teachers be engaged in the program has taken us a lot of time and training them to be, as you said, part of the program. But, uh, but once they're in, I think they're really good and they can really help to make things happen and to make things roll. And we're trying to make these partnerships with public teachers so that they can learn what we have learned and they don't have to go through that really steep curve that we went through. Um, and I just wonder if you have any examples of success where you have teachers from the private sectors, in my case, are very international teachers. We have teachers from Australia, Japan, New Zealand in our college, and taking it to the public sector just to, you know, like expand the good practices that you find. Thank you. So we have five minutes left. Uh, so you have 40 seconds now, I'm kidding. You have, you have one minute. <laughs> no, let's take one minute to reflect on this role of parents um, teachers, mobile, teachers' mobility, not necessarily international, but private, public, or sectors or regions, et cetera. Uh, let's take, please, one minute, because so, we really need to finish some time. Uh, parents, uh, again, they are very important in the system, and they are, they, we need the commitment from them. But I think it's more a society problem than a parent's problem. Uh, when I was answering to Andrea about the fact that education is not an issue so society-wise, uh, is I, I think we need to uh, understand that there are a lot of parents that do not have the education to be able to commit to, to their children's education. We had a president a long time ago in Argentina called Sarmiento, who is kind of the father of the Argentinian education system, the successful one, not the current one. Um, and he said the problem with education is that those that do not have it cannot ask for it. So people that have been a able enough or lucky enough to get education need to help others to get it. And I think that's uh, the role of solidarity we need to have in our societies to promote education and help parents that want their kids to get an education but do not understand and cannot measure the quality of education their kids are getting. And, and they realize that when they try to go to university and they fail, and that's, that's too late. And to the second point, I already, I think in our system, there is movement all the time. So we have private uh, school teachers teaching in public schools all the time. Um, but I do think mobility is very important. I do think that changing countries and exchanging teachers will 
build a much, much more, uh, much stronger teacher base all over the region. And I think we, we need to promote that uh, as much as we can. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to focus on the first question regarding the parents. Uh, we agree that if the parents, it's engaged, they, if they are engaged, the performance increases. And of course, technology can play a role very important on this because today parents lack time. They spend, you know, most of the time working. Uh, so what we do, we give visibility to the parent in what his kids are doing. So well, if they succeeded, if they're not going well, they receive a report every day on their mobile phone uh, to understand what, you know, how can he help actually the kid uh, for the positive way to say, oh, congratulations, you, you did well on this. And if he wants to also tell his kid that he wants to study more. So the first step for us is bringing him to the process. It needs to be something very easy. It needs to be mobile. Uh, and we see that the engagement of parents in you know reading these reports and asking for improvements is really, really high. So this is, for us, the first step to involve parents in the process. Thank you very much. Pasi, would you like to add? Sure, sure, yeah, about the parents' uh, engagement. Around the world, if you look at the, again, the global picture, what has happened is that parents, when they are engaged in the, the school and education, they're mostly interested in their own children's education, not the, uh, the other kids. And this has been a big change during the last 25, 30 years because of the school, uh, the school choice and, and uh, kind of individualized pathways that many people have. I think the, the key question here is that how do we make parents or citizens or like you said community interested in and engage in other other uh, families uh, kids education as well because that's what is what it what it means to build a system that people citizens would be concerned about educating everybody not only their own own children of course i have three sons and i'm mostly of course interested in my own kids education but i should never forget also the the importance of educating my neighbors and and fellow citizens children because if we forget that one then we we lose the community and that's why this is a very important point absolutely thank you um second. i think i'll answer to both uh, on a, with a general statement um I am worried and um, that we as leaders in education for Latin America need to be more realistic and actually be, from a marketing standpoint, segment exactly what we need because the technology topic is not, a, it's not general to everything. We have to be very realistic on, on where we are. In terms of the parents, they are definitely part of the ecosystem, but in Latin America, being very practical, they're more worried to send their kids to school and actually they invest a lot of their, of their available income mm -hmm. to education. And it continues to be the most important after household and food, continues to be their most important thing. So they, they're really eager to find the best education for their kids. But in our countries, they just take it for, take it for granted. They just send them to school, whether it's public and free or whether it's the, private. The, a private. They just take for granted the education program will, will be the right one. So as education leaders, we need to make sure the education programs are the right ones because parents will send the kids to school and they will do their best effort to do it. And in terms of the teachers, we should also be segmenting what exactly do we need. So it's, in real terms, it's very difficult to do the private-public combination, but what if there's a program in, with the governments that some of the teachers could actually be, be, be uh, awarded with an assignment in a, in a private school and paid for that, and the other way around too, uh, to give them cross-fertilization experience. Thank you. Very fast. I, I have to say that uh, the level of education of parents is very important for them to engage in the school systems. Uh, I completely agree that the engagement of parents is very important because they are a force in terms of demanding good education. But if you have half of the mothers in, the, in Latin America with the only finishing secondary school, they don't feel they have the, the, the knowledge and they just disengage completely. And you, we have asked them in PISA, why do they not get closer to the school system? And they say, because I'm not prepared. So uh, it's very important that in, in Latin America, um, girls are uh, uh, increasing substantially uh, their level of education. I think that's one of the good news that we have in the region, that girls are really now even getting more degrees in, in, in university levels. And that's going to help that engagement, because they will be feel strong to do so. The other point, public and private in Latin America doesn't make any difference public as as bad as, as, as uh, private are as bad 
as public. I'm sorry, but in average, I don't think that is a, a, a value for money in terms of sending kids to the private school. There are some good private schools, but in general, on average, no difference whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, it's better to understand those schools. And we have even very good uh, uh, experiences with even rural schools where you have good principals and good teachers the, uh, having outcomes that are even beyond what would you expect from them. So I would better do a matching between good performing schools and bad performing school and twinning them because that's what uh, some other school systems are doing and I think is working very nicely in terms of the, of the principal, the teachers and knowing what works and what doesn't. Th thank you. Just as a wrap up, I, I, I would like to us to leave with something and three things I want to emphasize. One, the learning and not education alone. That's interesting to me because maybe the forum can pick up the, even the name and send a message with that. Two, regional action. And you mentioned very concrete things teachers, mobility, organization, tech, that scale, you can do research, of course, data. And three, the alignment question. I found that fascinating. So what if perhaps we start thinking about organizations within country or regional organizations that don't exist or that exist and act poorly and, and where, where you can align better. The Panama Canal in Panama operates independently. It's public, but operates independently and so has a long-term perspective, works, you know, and it works nicely. So just as teasers, for future action. Thank you very much to this brilliant panel and thanks everyone for being Thank here. You. Thank you very much.